Good morning, everyone. I'm Taryn Saunders, Thought Leadership Manager at Trialog, and thank you for joining us this morning. Trialog hosts these virtual forums usually on the first Thursday of every month. This month, as you know, is Mandela Month, and in partnership with Bala World, we are discussing employee volunteering strategies beyond Mandela Month. And with our expert panelists, we'll explore how companies can make their employee volunteering programs more sustainable and impactful, and how nonprofits can use employee volunteering in the most strategic way for their organizations. Just a few technical points before we begin. There are two ways to engage. You are welcome to use the chat function to connect with fellow delegates and share your thoughts. And we also encourage you to ask questions, which we ask you to do via the Q&A box rather than the chat box. And we'll draw from these for our expert panelists to answer when we get to the discussion section. So please, if you can, direct your question to the relevant panelist and try and keep your questions succinct. And then a short survey will pop up on your screen at the end of the session, and it will also be shared with you via email. Please do share your th thoughts here so that we can keep improving these sessions for you. And please note that the session is being recorded and it will be shared with you as along with notes. Moving on to our agenda. After my brief introduction, I'll be handing over to each of our three panelists for their opening comments. We'll then dive into discussion and our panelists will answer some of your questions from the Q&A box. And then each panelist will give short closing comments. The first poll will appear on your screen now. We would like to know which type of organization you represent. We're just going to leave that on for a few seconds. We'd just like to begin with a brief overview of what Trialog does. So Trialog is one of a few consultancies that focus exclusively on responsible business. We do this through our consulting and advisory services, as well as through our knowledge sharing platforms. With our knowledge sharing platforms, Trialog convenes the annual Business in Society Conference, which took place in May at the Wanderers this year. And we also published the annual Business in Society Handbook, which sees its 26th edition this year. And if you haven't already contributed to the primary research, please do so before the end of July. And we also encourage you to profile your development work in this year's edition. Then the newly relaunched Trialog Knowledge Hub is an online library of research reporting, case studies, and information on responsible business and development to help inform responsible business decisions and help strengthen the impact of investment in development. And the write-up and recording of this webinar will be available on the Trilog Knowledge Hub. Then the Trilog Academy is an online learning platform offering courses for both nonprofits and companies. Let's have a look at the poll results. So here we can see that most of us on this call today are from nonprofit organizations followed by big businesses. Thank you. And now, before we hear from our panelists, let's look at the next poll. So we'd like to hear from you in another poll and to ask you, what do you think are the biggest reasons that employees do not volunteer regularly? And we'll leave this poll up for a few seconds.
Right, has everyone answered the poll? And let's have a look at those results. So most people on the call think the biggest reason is no time to volunteer, followed by that they do not know enough about volunteering initiatives and that there's not enough incentive from employer. Thank you so much for that. We can stop sharing the poll. So I'd just like to contextualize our discussion briefly by sharing some research into volunteering from the Trilogue Business in Society Handbook 2022 edition. So employee volunteering in 2022, the first two images here show the percentage of corporate respondents who answered yes and no to these two questions. So we can see that 75% of companies had employee volunteering programs in place in 2022. And of these, 64% had a stated EVP policy. And the third image here shows budget allocated to EVP with the red bar showing 2022 responses and the yellow bar showing the previous year's responses. And the average budget allocation to EVPs as a percentage of total CSI budgets was 6%. Now let's have a look at volunteering time. So this image shows the percentage of corporate responses that chose each option. So we can see that 52% of the corporate respondents offered eight hours or one day of paid volunteering time to employees each year. And the smallest percentage selected less than one working day. And this is very interesting to compare to the global median of 16 hours or two days. And let's have a look at staff management of volunteering programs. So with this image, we have the percentage of NPO respondents and the percentage of corporate respondents on either side. And the red bars show the 2022 responses with the yellow showing 2021 responses. And we can see that with our corporate respondents, most companies, that's 68%, have more than one person managing, one or more people managing volunteering, either in a full-time or a part-time capacity. Whereas with our NPOs, 57% have one or more people managing volunteering in a full-time or part-time capacity. And this is despite only 12% having a budget for volunteering. Now let's look at types of volunteering. So we asked about the types of EVPs received by NPOs and offered by companies. So here again, the first side of the image shows your NPO respondents and the other side shows corporate respondents. And we can see that most companies, 93%, organize staff volunteering initiatives. But far fewer NPOs, only 33%, were recipients of these. And this suggests that these initiatives are not reaching most NPOs. And then fundraising or collection drives are the second most popular type of EVP offered by companies, with the third being time off for people to volunteer during work hours. Lastly, we will look at the preferred types of volunteering. So we asked NPOs which type of volunteering programs are preferred and which are least preferred. And both sides of the image show the NPO responses. And here we can see that the most liked EVPs by NPOs were employee match funding, followed by fundraising or collection drives organized by the company, and then give as you earn programs. And these are of course directly, directly related to funding, but pro bono services share third place as the most liked type. And then the least preferred type of EVP is company organized volunteering initiatives, followed by time off for people to volunteer during work hours. I'd now like to introduce our panelists. 
And for now, their cameras and mics are off. And I'll ask them to turn their cameras on one by one as they share. They are Bobo Ngabe, who is the social impact consultant for Bala World. Rami Heltzinger, who's the CEO of For Good. And Danny Deliberto, who is the CEO and founder of Ladles of Love. And we'll start with Bobo. So Bala World's volunteering program is a key pillar of its social investment strategy. It places an emphasis on playing an active role in the communities that Bala World is part of. Bobo, can you please tell us more and describe your volunteering program as well as some of its benefits? And you can turn on your, your camera and mic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taryn, for the invitation. And good morning to everybody on the call and the webinar and my panelists. So uh, Butterworld takes uh, issues of volunteerism very seriously. We, I think uh, from way back, we've dedicated a day to employee volunteerism, but we go beyond that. Uh, we also ensure that uh, our employees can participate uh, by giving off their skills uh, to uh, beneficiaries that we have within the group, but also uh, the, on the side of the ESD. We have, uh, uh, Bala World has two types of uh, volunteerism. There's a center-led uh, company-driven volunteerism. Uh, I must say, I saw the, the, our, the statistics, but our employees do quite enjoy that one. But also we then have the ones that grounds up each uh, employee then nominates a, an NGO that they want to support through their team. And then we then do a match funding towards the end of the year. Those are very popular. And uh, we have a lot of pockets of excellence within the group where employees are able to uh, drive together an initiative and then they support those uh, uh, NGO. I must say mostly it's community-based organizations that they support who generally wouldn't have gotten support directly with us, but through their em employees' effort, we then do a match funding, but also allow the employees to then take time off beyond that one day that is dedicated to actually help uh, those particular NGO. I think it, that's cut across, partly because we operate beyond South African borders. I mean, locally it's done very well, it's streamlined and organized. And then in other markets where we operate, again, that's what drives our, uh, our CSI basically through the employee volunteerism. Uh, I would like to end the turn. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Bobo. I think that gives us a really good idea of this issue from a company perspective. And it's interesting to note how important em employee volunteering plays in, in the culture of the company as well and your overall CSI strategy. So thank you for sharing that with us. And next we'll hear from Romy. So Bobo, if you can turn your camera off for a second. Um, so, Romy, For Good developed a solution for businesses in response to the growing demand from corporate South Africa to expand the quantity, the quality, and the measurability of their staff's community involvement. And you now have over 20 companies as clients. And please, can you tell us what are the average participation rates in volunteering from your corporate client staff, as well as what factors or initiatives you think drive participation? Morning, Taryn, and thank you for having me. Um, hello to everyone on the call. Um, so interesting enough, as Taryn said, we do um, measure scale um, over 20 of South Africa's top corporates employee volunteering programs. Um, so I, when, when I talk about stats, that's the area that I'm talking about. So to give you um, an indication, when, we, when I talk about registrations, it's when an employee signs up on their digital um, platform from Jan to December 2022, across all of our clients, um, our highest client reached 2,402 registrations in a year, but the actual average was 444. Um, then we have a look at connections. What is a connection? A connection, when, when, a connection is when someone goes to a cause and actually does something. So it could be donating goods, 
uh, donating your time, mentoring a kid, et cetera. Same time period, Jan to December 2022. On average across all of our clients, it was 503. However, our highest client reached 1,863. Then we look at, and we measure, and it's more of an internal measuring tool that we look at at for good, but it, it certainly keeps us on track. And we look at unique participation. Now, this is when one employee does a minimum of one action. So for instance, Rami goes on to Barlow World's EVP um, platform and does, five, and, and does five volunteering activities. We count it as one. Um, and the unique part from January to December, 2022, the average unique participation across all of our clients was 23%. Now, this is not the norm. This is extremely high. Um, and with one of our clients actually getting to 57%. But please note, average, uh, industry average, and we've taken this across the last eight years, is 15%. And 15%, in our opinion, is really good. Um, but the numbers recorded last year were higher than the industry average. And as I said, is a good number and anything over that um, is even more brilliant. Thanks, Taryn. Thank you so much, Rami. I think that gives us a really good idea as well of why it's so important to measure those initiatives and, and some of the factors that you take into account. Um, I think that load shedding has pulled Danny off our call for a second. So um, Rami, if you don't mind, just to chat a little bit more about that. So you run a digital platform that, that acts almost as an in-between between the two types of organizations. And I'm, I'm interested to know, so in Trialogue's 2021 webinar on virtual volunteering, the panelists suggested that virtual volunteering was a trend that was here to stay. And I'm interested to hear whether you think this trend has come to fruition and also what other trends you think could impact us in South Africa with, with volunteering. Sure. So funny enough, I, I did a I did a capacity, uh, a NGO capacity workshop on Monday um, or on Tuesday. And funny enough, one of the very interesting or quite worrying stats is that over the past couple of years, and I'm talking about six years, um, bar the first year of COVID, that 50 percent of all corporate volunteering happens in Mandela month. Um, and this is against against our, our 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 numbers of over twenty corporate clients, which is I mean is this good or is this bad? Um, this year we're seeing a lower trend, so we're seeing more active um, participation throughout the year, and we saw a decrease in this year's Mandela Mandela month to forty two percent. Virtual volunteering is here to stay. Um, certainly, you know. Um, People don't have time. People are working uh, in hybrid situations. We're taking on more meetings again, uh, every day. So our meetings where we used to drive, you know, we used to have three meetings a day. We're now trying to fit in six. Um, so virtual volunteering is a great opportunity for anyone that's got an internet connection and a laptop to really make a difference. If I look at my stats on my platform, currently um, on our front facing site where anyone in South Africa can go and volunteer, um, we've got about 400 um, in-person opportunities right now versus 200 virtual volunteering um, actions. So that um, indicates or shows me that the NGOs are still requiring that virtual volunteering and most certainly that our corporate employees are still very much interested um, in virtual opportunities. Um, virtual time volunteering, we see half of these leads uh, needs are actively um, loaded by our causes, by our NGOs. Um, you don't need to go in person to write a fundraising proposal, as an example. If you're a marketing executive, you don't need to drive to the cause. They can just send you a brief on what they need, what they are um, in terms of their logo, their CI, etc. So we are still seeing a very high uptake um, in terms of uh, virtual volunteering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rami. That's very interesting. And it shows how we have to keep innovating as these trends change. And Bobo, I'd like to hear from you as well from the company perspective, um, whether virtual volunteering has been something that your employees have taken up more and, and what kind of trends and participation rates have come in from, from your employees. 
Okay, thanks, Tarun. What, what happened is during the pandemic, we did implement a virtual volunteerism and it, it did pick up quite a lot, but we've seen a dip. I think people get screen fatigued uh, and they want some physicality, but it's still there, particularly for our colleagues outside uh, South Africa. And I saw a question on the timeline asking, what is virtual uh, volunteerism? What happens is, remember, we've got organizations that need assistance with the, um, let's say uh, financials and bookkeeping and all that. So we encourage then we've created a platform internally that then the NGOs can plug in and then they go to uh, finance interns who then help them to structure their finances and all that, but also ensure that uh, the, the benefit, the, I mean, the intended beneficiary, meaning the end user of the NGO can get in touch with our employees, i.e. guys that are doing, um, what is it, afternoon uh, learning platforms. So those uh, elements have been able to be uh, migrated to the virtual platform and it's still ongoing. I think uh, in terms of percentage, um, I would say it's about 65% participation rate, uh, Taryn. Thank you, Bobo. That's very interesting to note. Um, and also on that point as well, I mean, you, you mentioned the, 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 the percentage of participation rates, but I'm also interested to know, how do you get participation rates up in a company? So are there any strategies that you've tried with your employees and, and what, what lessons have you learned from those? It's very interesting because in our environment, what happened is, during the COVID, we will send out a publication asking employees how would they like to participate. And the issue of virtual actually came from the employees themselves. And then our IT department was instrumental in creating that particular platform uh, to help the employees to be able to participate. So it, it, it's engaging, it's keeping employees aware of uh, initiative that the business is doing. So the virtual platform was created there of off by uh, running a competition, uh, making sure that uh, employees give us ideas in terms of how we could participate. And they came up with those fresh ideas. Uh, so, and the IT was instrumental in making sure that we have a platform that's alive uh, that can then be used by employees. So yeah, it came from the employees themselves. And you continuously hype it up, you know, and sensitize employees and through our normal, uh, what is it, internal uh, communication platforms. Thank you. And that's very interesting to note that the virtual volunteering was something that was requested specifically and, and driven by your employees themselves. So thank you for sharing that. And I see that load shedding has allowed Danny back on our call. So Danny, if I can ask you, so for NPOs, you will bring in our NPO perspective. And as you know, managing a group of volunteers can be time consuming and resource heavy. How do you manage corporate volunteers in a way that allows your NPO to get what it most needs from a company's volunteering efforts? Morning, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry for that. Um, load shedding is never fun in this country. Um, so we have a, a program manager who's dedicated to our volunteering. Um, volunteering has always been an, a very important part of our organization. Uh, when I first started Ladles of Love, um, I saw what people were saying to me, how they appreciated that we made volunteering easy, um, that all they needed to do was really just arrive and, and be guided. And so, um, as I said, it became an integral part of, of Ladles of Love. And so we're very passionate about creating volunteering opportunities, not <clears throat> because it also encourages our love activism, as we call it, about being kind, being kind to each other. So having a program director or program manager to our love activism program, um, who then communicates with our, our, our uh, with the corporates, and we we are able to create an event that's almost like a team building. It can be a team building because of all the different um, opportunities that we have for volunteering. We are able to then create uh, a, a 
a program for the day uh, that will suit the, the, the corporate. So we engage with the corporate, we see what they want to achieve, and then we set out uh, to make that happen. Thank you so much, Danny. And I think that that really brings around the importance of the communication between the NPO and the corporates as well, which is a very important point to highlight. Thank you. And if I can ask you, Danny, just to jump in again for another question. So Ladles of Love aim to break a world record this Mandela Day for the most number of volunteers offering their time. So how did that go? And of course, importantly, with our theme today, how are you hoping that this event will have an impact beyond Mandela Month? Uh, it went very well, if I may say, um, through our Mandela Day event, um, through engaging with corporates. Um, for some reason, um, we, we did our very first Mandela Day event in 2015. And as the years went by, I saw how more and more corporates were engaging with us. <clears throat> and that's why, once again, uh, Mandela Day became about creating 67 minutes. That's what Mandela Day is about. It's about creating opportunities for people to do their 67 minutes. Um, like I said, I, I think people do often struggle. They don't know what they want to do. But if you provide the platform that makes the decision easy, then they will engage with you. So um, our goal was we set out to create 6,700 opportunities for people to do their 67 minutes. We called on 6,700 people to join us to do their 67 minutes. And uh, through our event and through activations and encouraging corporates um, who then, who engaged with us and said, we wanna do a Mandela Day event, we wanna make sandwiches and we want you to be the beneficiary of it. Together, we collectively were able to work with 6,003 volunteers. That's the number we managed to to, to, to um, get through all our data. So it, it was an amazing experience. Um, uh, it's, it's been our biggest volunteering opportunity. We've never had 6,003 6, people engage with us on one day. And um, I think it's, it, <clears throat> we do promote Mandela Day because it is important that it's not just one day. And that um, it, is, it is really important that we do engage people in volunteering or make people aware of volunteering. And, and I think um, what's important, I know there's a lot of MPOs on, on this chat as by the poll that you shared with us. It's really important that MPOs create volunteer opportunities to engage with corporates because it's something that needs to happen in our country. We have a huge amount of inequality. And it, it's the only way we can bring hope into our country is if we take care of each other. And, and for me, volunteering is, is a part of that. Thank you so much, Danny, and congratulations on that event. And, and thank you for pulling out those points there for, for NPOs to notice as, as well with making their volunteering more sustainable. I'm interested to touch on that a little bit further. Um, in terms of whether you have some tips or advice for, for companies, or what is one thing that you wish you knew, that, that you wish all companies knew when connecting with an NPO for their employee volunteering programs? The, for organizations like Ladles of Love to create volunteering opportunities, it is really great that they provide the manpower but corporates need to also understand that to create these volunteering opportunities, it costs the nonprofit money to create those opportunities. I'll give you an example. Uh, we often have sandwich drives that we connect with corporates. Now, for us to, to do a sandwich drive, we have to buy the bread. We can't, we can't always get the bread for free. Every now and then we do get a donation. We have to buy the peanut butter, which has become increased, has become crazy expensive. To give you an idea, tw a 20 kilo ticket of peanut butter is not close to a thousand rand. And we've got to buy the jam and we've got to get all the gloves and we've got to set out our space in our warehouse or we've got to take stuff to the corporate's office to make it happen. So we do sometimes get 
um, resistance from corporates that say, but we, we're giving you, we're giving you, we're volunteering. Why should we pay for it? As an MPO, we incur the expenses as well. Unfortunately, we can't always get stuff for free. And nonprofits are as much a business as a business is itself. Um, uh, if, a, if, a, if a nonprofit does not incur expenses, it cannot, it cannot run its organization that will create impact. So for me, I think um, uh, it's really important that, that the corporate world understands that the nonprofit, we need money as well <laughs> to run our organization, to run the volunteering programs. I have, for example, my program manager. I've got to pay her a salary every month. Um, I cannot get that either, unless I get donations or I get corporates to engage with us with money. So, so it's it's about providing the volunteering, very important because I think it's corporates' responsibility as well to to promote volunteering, to create a better South Africa. But it's also important that corporates understand that as an organisation, we need money to run those programs. So, I, I hope that helps and makes sense. Thank you, Danny. I think that those, both, all of the points that you've raised are, are very important for both corporates and NPOs to keep in mind as they connect and collaborate and make these programs more sustainable and their volunteering programs more sustainable. So thank you for sharing that. And there's a question in the Q&A box uh, for Romy. Um, so it is from Jaden Thomas, who mentions that For Good is an amazing platform to connect with corporates and NPOs but that they find it difficult sometimes to get donations. So for example, assistance with repairs for infrastructure or a, there's a sponsor resident campaign where they crowdfund and whether you have any advice for, for allowing those organizations to get donations and other kinds of assistance. Absolutely. So the, we are a digital platform at the end of the day. Um, and what our digital platform allows is for the NGOs or the causes to upload what they actually need in real time. So you get, we get a handful of our causes that drink our turquoise ju juice every day and they are just uploading needs. And, they, and these leads are, uh, needs are aggregated, right? So if a citizen or a corporate employee goes on, they will see their need um, on, on the first page of our homepage. If you're not terribly um, digital savvy or you aren't maintaining your, your cause profile, the, the chances of a corporate or a employee or a volunteer seeing your needs are actually minimal to none. But we do have an incredible cause team headed up by Zamo, and she, her, her main job is to educate the NGOs on how to use our platform. Um, and in some instances, um, and she often reaches out and said, guys, Tell me what you need. If you've got initiatives going on, tell us what you need. We will help you upload these needs in our platform. But you do have to have an element of, um, you know, maintaining your 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 for good profile, like you would a, a Facebook, etc. But it, and if you don't have the time, because often what we find, especially with NGOs, it's so well-meaning people, but they're on the ground. They are saving lives. They are feeding. They are feeding people their only meal of the day. They're not sitting behind a computer like you and I are, right? But we have got a, a fully fledged team inside for good to actually help you um, help you navigate that. But it, it's quite simple. The more you ask for, the more active you are, the more chances are you get, uh, grabbing attention. Thank you so much. And um, Danny, I'd also like to hear your perspective on that question. I mean, obviously not pertaining to a platform in particular, but for NPOs to, to be able to get the specific type of assistance or donations that they do require, and obviously this is different for every organization, what are some strategies that you would suggest to, to help NPOs communicate this? Sorry, Danny, if you could unmute there, please. Apologies. Brilliant. Um the first thing I'd like to say is there's, there's this beautiful word, word called mindset. And for me, mindset is what are the words we use or we tell ourselves that creates a paradigm that we, we live, that we live and operate our life through. And over the years, what I've, I've come to learn 
well, with ladles of love, as I saw the organization growing, I had to firstly realize that, yes, we are a charity, but if I have a charity mindset, my organization cannot continue to grow. Uh, and so I, I moved my mindset from charity mindset to that of a business mindset. I had to understand that our organization had to be run like a business uh, in order for us to grow and create and to, to grow our impact. That was the first thing. Then, then the next mind shift change that, that I had was that the word donors, and yes, donors are very important to the organization, but if you see them as donors, I don't see our donors as donors any longer. I prefer to call them our stakeholders. We are here to say, we want to walk with you. We want to create change in our country. If you want to create change, then join us. And that means either through volunteering, through, through donating, whatever it is, but walk a journey with us. You are not our donor. I'm not putting my hand out and begging for money. I just, I don't do that anymore. Our mindset of our team is how do we create relationships with the corporates? So those have been two very important mind, mind shift changes that have allowed our organization to grow. And um, that's the first thing. And then, like anything, we, we had to invest in our business, we, in our organization, in our charity. Um, we've had to invest in our website because website is our point of contact with our, our donors and with, with, with the public in large. We've had to invest in a customer relation management system. We work through Salesforce. And that way we are able to track all our donors. We are able to communicate with all our donors and um, we are able to keep our donors up to date. Uh, with what we do. We also invest in four donor reports annually um, because we need to share our stats and what we're doing. Corporates, people, they want to see what, what you're doing. It's, it's not about showing off what you're doing. It's about saying, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing with your money. And it's really important that you understand. And we show. So also within our organization, we track as much statistics as we can as possible that shows impact that we are creating. And then we also, I call it, you know, all that I call our social, our, our fundraising wheel. Uh, and each bit has its aspect towards our fundraising wheel. Social media is an integral part of, of, of Ladles of Love um, because it's like anything, we're a charity, but this is our brand and we need to market our brand. We need, when people see this brand, they need to say, yes, this organization is creative impact. This organization are transparent. This is an organization we can trust to do the change. And that's really important. So social media becomes a very important part. And then of course your fundraising, your actual fundraising. And that is something I'm still working on because that's constantly changing. Like there's grants, there's, Try, I mean, as a nonprofit trying to get into a corporate, <laughs> the number of emails, who's the person, it, it can take months, years to, to connect with a corporate. And, and you have to invest big money in salaries to get these people that will help you. So, so as an organization, you've got, to, you've got to build towards that. And you can only do that with the business mindset. Um, and, and, and that's how I encourage um, um, organization and nonprofits to grow and to grow their impact. If you want to grow your impact, that's what's required. Well, I believe. Thank you so much, Danny. Some very important points coming through there, especially around mindset and the, and the way that NPOs view themselves as, as part of the strategy. And Romy, I see that you had your hand up as well. Sorry, just to just to work on what Danny was just to um, expand on what Danny was saying, I've got a I've got a I did a, a, a chat a little while ago on greenwashing or whatever that you know might be or might look like to to different people. But I've got the I've got the most pertinent example. This year, Mandela Day, a cause that we work with, um, they were granted two million rand. 
and they were like, oh my gosh, this is, this is incredible. And they're like, but you must use the 2 million rand to buy a container uh, as a library for their kids. But the, and the courts were like, but we, 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 we've, got a, we've got a library. They're like, the 2 million rand goes towards the container and we're going to create a, a, a library. So no one, and they took it, right? Because uh, Mandela Month um, is a foot in the door for most N NGOs. They're never going to say no, because in the hopes that you're going to come back and you're going to support them, right? Um, no one actually asked that cause, Sherbert, you know, what, what, what can you actually do with that 2 million rand? So I asked the, the CEO of the cause, and he said, you know what, salaries. I don't know how I'm going to pay salaries this month. Um, and that's like a fundamental flaw. And just, uh, just going back to what Danny was saying about treating the causes as a business. Often, you know, we, we, we are not a cause. So we are a for-profit for um, social impact company. But when we ask to find opportunities for our um, corporates to get involved with, and don't get me wrong, majority of our corporates do it exceptionally well. And one or two can still learn. But they'll say, oh, cut down on the amount of, I'll use a frivolous example, sandwiches being made. Or cut down on uh, the amount of GBV packs we're going to make because um, and include their corporate T-shirts, um, travel, and lunch for the guys. So, you know, it, it's got to be well-intentioned, right? So giving is always well-intentioned, but it's so often misaligned. And that's my biggest, I, I promised my team today I wasn't going to come on and rant about Mandela Man. Um, so I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Thank you so much, Rami. And I think that really highlights the importance of considering and communicating what is actually needed by that specific NPO when a volunteering initiative is, is brought in by a corporate. Um, and I see, Volvo, you've got something to add to that as well. Sorry, if you could unmute. Yeah. Thank you. So both what Denny and Rami has said is so true. I just want to add that, you know, from a volunteer, I mean, yeah, volunteering is a foot in the door in terms of introducing yourself to a corporate via the employees that are participating in our space, particularly because the employees choose the NGOs. And then to an extent that we do a match funding, we then begin to interact with that NGO. But what I wanted to add on the issues of strategy is very important for NGOs to understand that uh, companies uh, guard their reputation very much. So I like what Denu was saying, the element of transparency and building relationships, you know, because I think th there's a struggle of a credible, what is a credible NGO and what does it do? Hence, there's a very much skimish way of not uh, engaging CBOs particularly. But if you're transparent and you've got your, 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 your organization proper, I mean, the platforms like uh, For Good, they also enable us to actually interact with those NGO because at least there's a vetting mechanism, right? So, and uh, the, and, I mean, the, the corporates, they also have a slim uh, volunteer, I mean, staff uh, in terms of making sure that they enable these NGO activities. So for me, those two things critical to understand as an NGO that they will, corporate will get their reputation first. You know, so they would never partner with somebody that uh, is uh, unscrupulous and or has a bad reputation or deals with a, a bad thing. So those are the things that you need to guard against. But yeah, I think the relationship building, but I think what I wanted to add as a grain is that, you know, as an NGO, you, when you build that relationship, educate the corporate in terms of these things don't run by themselves, you can't then volunteer and expect all the funds that have been contributed to go to the cause. You know, there has to be a, a percentage that is dedicated to your staff that uh, uh, enable that volunteering program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bobo. And it's, it's great to be able to get that perspective from you as well and how how companies can bring NPOs in to be part of the company's strategy and, and part of what the company wants to put out to the world as well. So thank you for that. Um, related to that, and this question is, is for Danny from Riyadh. So Danny, how do you manage the expectations of corporates when they do volunteer, firstly to protect the dignity of your clients, 
Um, it's mentioned that often corporates want to promote their volunteering work, but that can come at the expense of creating poverty voyeurism. So how do you protect the dignity of your clients when, when they do volunteer? Um, I think it's about, sure, let me reflect on that question. I, I, I feel, firstly, for us, volunteering, as I said, is the essence of, it's, it's part of the essence of Ladles of Love. So, so when, it's, when your purpose of volunteering, when your primary purpose of volunteering is to, to do good, and to promote volunteering, then it's going to happen naturally. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, it will, it, because it's coming from that purpose-driven reason that you are doing volunteering. So we will, when we engage with corporates, obviously we will only do things that we do. Um, for example, uh, our sandwich drive has been hugely successful. So we will promote sandwich drive with corporates we will allow them to bring their banners we'll do the social media because we understand that that and and you know for me i think it's really important that corporates share these events to promote other corporates to do the same so i don't have a problem with with corporates wanting to bring their banners and and do and do their bit and show other people that they're doing it and that they're promoting volunteering and then doing what we do so you'll come we'll make the sandwiches we'll make it a fun time and uh, we will then ensure that those sandwiches get to our beneficiaries because that's the purpose of the sandwich and it's really important that we get them to the beneficiary fresh so it's done almost immediately so i think when, when your primary purpose for volunteering comes from a place of doing it for impact, doing it for the people that you're wanting to help, then it just all falls into place. I don't know if that makes, makes sense. And then I think also, if sorry to, I, I, I think it's really important that, that the, it, it, the corporate, is, for the corporate organization, it needs to align with what they do because it's difficult as well when they come in and then they start dictating what they want um you know it's, it's so so there needs to be alignment between mpo and corporate it, it, it needs to reach what the corporate wants to achieve out of it and it needs to reach what the mpo wants to achieve out of it i think that's also very important thank you so much danny and in your answer to the previous question, I mean, you also mentioned beneficiaries as, as part of your response and, and speaking about dignity and, and mindset there. And there's a question for you related specifically to beneficiaries in terms of how can one change the beneficiary's mindset to create a multiplier impact effect? You know, the only person that can change you is you. So I think the you know, I can't change anyone's mindset. I can only lead by example and create inspiration that will encourage others to do the same. So sharing, you know, I've had conversation with our beneficiaries about how, you know, you change your mindset. And for some, there's some of our beneficiaries that it's changed their outlook. They, they, run, their benef they run their little organization very differently and they feel very inspired. So, so it's about leading by example, because I can't change anyone. Um, only you can change you. So that's, that's um, and then those obviously that do resonate with you, that you support them and that you encourage them to continue with the change and give them and try and help them where you can to, to encourage that mind shift change. Thank you so much, Danny. We appreciate that insight. And thank you so much for, for answering your question, for answering the questions from the delegates. And I'm now going to ask each of the panelists for, for your brief closing thoughts. What do you recommend that companies do to drive volunteering impact beyond Mandela Month? And we'll start with Bobo. 
Thanks, Taran. I think it starts with having a strategy and uh, also designing a form of a policy that will allow, particularly big businesses, that will allow different business units to actually drive their own initiative. So if you have a strategy as well as a policy, that's a guiding principle, but also don't end the, you know, monthly do a lot of uh, campaigns and drive and encouraging employees to participate. I think we are lucky that uh, the current millennials are very vocal and they like uh, issue a corporate that has some form of responsibility. So you need to be active in that space and hold these types of webinars, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bobo. And Rami, the same question for you. What are your recommendations for companies to drive their volunteering impact beyond this month? So permission to play. A lot of um, corporates have got um, structured employee volunteering digital platforms as an example. But if you don't actually allow your employees to go and volunteer, and that comes in numerous forms like volunteer hours or a day off, you know, some corporates even give their volunteers five days of the year. Um, so that's volunteer hours and then permission to play. So a lot of the time you'll see in corporates, go and volunteer, it's fantastic. But then the line manager is actually saying, no, we're, we're on a deadline and you can't. Um, matching programs work exceptionally well. Unstructured volunteering. So as Bobo mentioned, um, corporates uh, like to incorporate their volunteering into their CSI, CSR um, structure, which is fantastic. Um, but as an example, if you love animals and it's not part of a thing, we you know, offer still opportunities to go and volunteer your time with animals or a cause that's close to your heart. Um, champions, so creating champions inside your, your businesses, people that are passionate about giving back and let them spread the word. Um, recognition and awards, they do help. Um, more importantly, marketing support, marketing and HR. Um, you, you can have a fantastic platform, but if you aren't marketing it to your colleagues, to your employees, no one's going to know about it. Um, HR support, volunteering is a huge um, uh, bonus to the HR as a, a department, as employee engagement programs. And so often or not, you'll not see HR involved in the volunteering discussion. And then executive support, top down. You know, if the CEO of the company is planting gardens, um, taking time off, going with the employees and allowing them, as I said, permission to play, um, leading from above. Thank you so much, Romy. There were very many helpful points in that. Thank you. And Danny, from your perspective, what are your recommendations to companies for sustaining their volunteering impact? Well, Romy touched on the point that I was going to share, and that is that, um, and yes, very important that Volvo says there needs to be a policy and structure in place, but it needs to become the culture of the organization. Um, volunteering needs to be your know, culture. So it needs to, the, the, it needs to come from the CEO. Um, um, in that the CEO believes that volunteering is, 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 is important. It can't just be a tick uh, for a CEO. And it needs to be, the CEO needs to drive the CSI. Um, and like Romy says, needs to go to the volunteering. Obviously, they can't go to all, and I get we've all got busy schedules, but the, I've done so many team buildings, and I've never, once or twice, I'll see the CEO, and it'll literally be quick in, put, do something, let's take pictures, and he's gone. That, that, and I, I'm, not, I'm not judging. If you want the truth, that's it has to come. It is so important that it comes from the top down. Otherwise, it will be a tick in the box. Thank you so much, Danny. I think that's a very important point to close on, that it is, this is so much more about a tick box exercise and so much more about a single day and a single month but rather a culture that we can all be involved in, in all kinds of organizations and from every level, as you mentioned. So thank you for that. 
And thank you to all of our panelists for your time and your insights today. I'd just like to return to one last slide just to share how you can keep in touch with us and to see how we can keep this conversation going. So you can read more about employee engagement, funding, volunteering, and many other responsible business and development topics on the Trilog, on the Trilog Knowledge Hub. You can increase your nonprofit's visibility through inclusion in the NPO directory, which is also on the Trilog Knowledge Hub. And then, of course, you can participate in the Trilog Business and Society Handbook 2023. You can participate in the primary research into the state of CSI in South, in South Africa. And for both corporates and nonprofits, the, the research survey closes on the 31st of July. And then, of course, you can advertise your company, share value and social investment stories, or your nonprofit's activities and results. And then please do connect with us on your social media platform of choice, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or X, or Instagram. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day ahead.